This is Media Path, where we become obsessed about a given topic and go down the pathway until we've completely sated our curiosity. I am Louise Palanker. And I'm Fritz Coleman. And joining us today is our esteemed guest, John O'Connor. John is an experienced trial lawyer practicing law in San Francisco since 1972. He has tried cases in state and federal court throughout the country. He served as an assistant U.S. attorney in North California from 1974 through 1979, representing the United States in both criminal and civil cases. Among his interesting assignments have been representation of the government during the OPEC oil embargo of the 1970s, writing Fifth Amendment and State of Mind briefs for the prosecution in United States versus Patricia Hearst and representing W. Mark Felt regarding the revelation of his identity as Deep Throat. John's father, John C. O'Connor, was a former FBI agent, a prominent Indianapolis lawyer and Democratic politician and senior partner in the Indianapolis law firm of Ruckelshaus, Bobbitt and O'Connor. Welcome, John. Good to be with you. It's so great to have you. Nice to have have you, you, John. My stepfather was an FBI agent, so I already like you. There. They're great uh, people. <laughs> they really are. Yeah, I mean, I think it takes a, a, like a ton of character to uh, to bring your giant mind into that field where you're going to be making less money than you would in the private sector. So I think those are people who have devoted themselves to honor and country, and I, I applaud them. Yes. John, l- let me ask you from the very beginning, because this is a, a question I've had ever since the Deep Throat Revelation, which of course was born out of your Vanity Fair article, in Washington, D.C., that leaks like a sieve. How did it take so long for the world to be aware of the identity of Mark Felt? Well, the way I would answer it is this. It's not a question of leaks. It's a question of whether the media has the capacity to Uh, consider circumstantial evidence and come to a conclusion. I was a prosecutor. I looked at circumstantial evidence back in 1974 to 76. Uh, I was just a junior guy at the time, so I don't claim to have been a genius or a real experienced guy at the time. But I could figure it out beyond a reasonable doubt. There was no doubt in my mind. I thought I could prove it to a unanimous jury. The information was out there. But my real issue is, is that the media was unable to process that information because that's not what the media is capable of doing. And, and lawyers like me were not generally that interested in the topic. The people who were searching for Deep Throat were journalists. So one of, my, one of Deep Throat's complaints to Bob Woodward, interestingly enough, if you go back and read All the President's Men, he said he distrusted the press because it was shallow, superficial, and too quick to make judgments. And I, I agree with that. And, but, and I think the press plays a tremendously important part in our nation and our democracy. But we shouldn't ask the media, which is supposed to be reporting who, what, when, where, report the competing arguments. I don't think the media should really be tasked with deciding issues of tremendous complexity and import. Well, uh, they, they have very different imperatives. The, the media, they're, they're on a time crunch. They've got to get a story out and they want eyes on it. And the FBI wants to do a thorough and, and fair investigation. And the politicians have their agendas. And, you know, I think what you find in Washington is just a, an exemplification of what you would find anywhere else, which is that everyone has their own agenda and their own what matters to them most. And so the, con- the confluence of, of Bob Woodward and Mark Felt is fascinating because it was just this explosion of two different agendas that, that brought down uh, the Nixon White House. Right. And if we look at what Mark Felt really added to Bob Woodward, it was not, as they say, uh, giving him fish today. That's what he, but teaching him how to fish. Uh, when Woodward famously went to the garage and almost shook felt by the lapels and asked him, demanded that he quit playing this, quote, chicken shit, unquote, game. What he was saying is, give me the facts, give it to me so I can just take it and run and, and repeat it in the paper like a mimeograph machine. 
but felt uh, for various ethical reasons, didn't want to do that. He did not think it was right to give information out of a confidential file. He was very ethical. He, but he wanted Woodward to report the story right. So he, what he was really doing was teaching him to be a mini FBI agent. Mm-hmm. Here's where you go. Here's what you do. Now, what did they do that first night? They sat on the floor for seven hours, for seven hours, and he tried to get him to understand the circumstantial evidence in the case, how you draw inference. It's what lawyers do all the time, what we're trained to do. But by God, I mean, they call it practicing law. I've been doing it for 48 years and went to law school for four years before that. And I'm just now probably getting good at it. Uh, so, uh, So that's what felt added to Woodward and made such a, a, a potent mix, shall I say, because they got the story right. Well, give us some background on, on uh, how you were able to discern the identity of the man known only as Deep Throat, because it's not just that it kind of occurred to you. You really did some digging and, and you right. did some research. How, how did you come to that awareness? Well, I'm convinced that it's not so much getting piles and piles of information but it is understanding what you have right in front of you, right? And and that if you look at a document, and this is one of the things I was discovering at the very same time as a young prosecutor, and before that I worked for a fellow named Melvin Belli, and who was quite a trial lawyer. So I had some real uh, good initiation into this field, but I felt if you looked at a document, you didn't just take a document, read it and throw it to the side. Everyone can get the skimming meaning of that document. But when you want inferences from it, you've got to sit there and look at it. So what I did was not so much get information that no one else had. I just took the information that everybody else had, and I thought about it. And I thought about the inferences. And once you think about the inferences, a document comes alive. And let me give you an example. It says, is this something I can do here that you would want me to do? Oh, yeah. If it is, then let me tell you one. Everyone knew about Woodward and Bernstein's screw-up. They admit it now. This is their big screw-up was when they reported that Hugh Sloan, the treasurer for the committee to re-elect the president, had testified that H.R. Haldeman, Nixon's chief of staff, was a signatory on the infamous slush fund, a whole bunch of money that was in cash and unreported that was in a safe somewhere near the White House. Uh, Now, The Post got it wrong. But before they published, a couple of FBI agents, apparently mistaken, junior, lower level FBI agents had confirmed the Haldeman story, mixing up Ehrlichman for Haldeman, his Teutonic twin. John Ehrlichman and uh, H.R. Haldeman were often mixed up. So the FBI agent actually got them mixed up and said, you can go with the story that Haldeman was named in the grand jury testimony. They went to deep throat. Woodward asked Deep Throat to confirm he wouldn't do it. They published the story anyway, and it was wrong. It was wrong, but it was wrong not because Haldeman was not a signatory. He was a signatory. It was wrong because Hugh Sloan did not testify to it. Now, Woodward made a big deal. If you look at his book, if you look at the newspaper reports, they try to undo it by having this anonymous source say, well, H.R. Haldeman really was a signatory. That was probably felt that was trying to help Woodward erase his error, okay? But here's what I say. I'm looking at this, I'm just a young guy, goes to coffee shops and bars, basically in my spare time and and thinks about this. And I looked at this and looked at this and I said, oh, he's asking Deep Throat to confirm because Deep Throat had access to a transcript, Mm -hmm. a transcript of the grand jury. He would only ask him to confirm if he thought Deep Throat had a transcript. No one in the White House would have a transcript to the grand jury. No one out the there. FBI would. Only the FBI, only selected people in the FBI, by the way, at the very height or as the their source, the guy right on the spot in, in, in D.C., or the very tip top of the Justice Department uh, legal part as opposed to the FBI. So that narrows your your scope down to maybe five or six people. Well, I knew it was probably an FBI agent, but there you could keep going and going on that. And I could do this and, and bore you for the next, literally, I could write a 500 page book on this. In my book, I just skimmed the surface of some of the key parts that I looked at. But 
It's process of elimination. You know, uh, I'll tell you, we'll talk more about this when we talk about postgate. But in a general sense, the Bob Woodward topic, you uh, made note of the fact that Woodward uh, is guilty of having cherry picked the information. All the information you needed about the truth was there. But Woodstein, as you like to uh, combine them and call them, was cherry picking the information. So it was almost dishonesty by omission in what they didn't say in their reporting. Right. Every lawyer understands that the best way to commit fraud is by concealment. You want to buy a piece of property from me and ask me if it's got water because you're going to grow alfalfa on the back 40. I say it's got plenty of water. And now that you can, it gushes out at 20 feet. Isn't this wonderful? You say, okay, you buy the property. And I have not told you that that uh, water is uh, permeated with toxins. I have committed fraud dead bang fraud, I can be criminally prosecuted for that. Uh, but that's exactly what Woodward and Bernstein did in its Watergate reporting. Most of what they said, with very little exception I go through in my book, is, is, is true insofar as it goes. But they are lying, as it were, deceiving by omission and concealment. And uh, the Enron people are all in jail because they concealed the risk that they were taking. They didn't say anything that was untrue. They just didn't say things that were true. So we find that those are the, that that's the most prevalent kind of fraud you will find out there. Now let's go to your, your realization that, that it was Mark Felt all along. That right. came back around in your life and literally took a seat at your table. Can you tell us that story? Yes, it was around the fall of 76. It was right after the movie came out where there was a little added detail there about George Wallace's shooter. And I said, my gosh. And there was another thing I indicated in my book when I was investigating the Carter administration and I came to a little bit of a, an epiphany. But here we are, fall of 76. I come to the conclusion, this has to be Mark Felt 20 times over, I can prove this. And at that point, uh, I was falling for a cute little girl and we were gonna get married. And I went ahead and started uh, into my career and 25 years later, I'm sitting at the very table I'm sitting at now and uh, with my daughter's friends from Stanford. And I was telling funny stories about my father, my father's uh, adventures as an FBI agent in Brazil during the war where he's chasing Germans and he's supposed to be a spy. He's undercover. And one of the fellows across the table from me said, well, you know, Big John, my grandfather was in the FBI. Maybe your father knew my grandfather. So, well, what's his name, Nick? And he said, well, his name's Mark Felt. Maybe you've heard of him. And I, of course, almost <laughs> fell out of my chair. And I said, Nick, your grandfather's deep throat. Do you know that? And he said, well, he's always denied it. Uh, you know, there's some things we've thought of lately. Maybe, you know, there's some hints that's him. But, boy, he's always denied it. I said, please, please talk to your mother. Let me come up and talk to him. I think I know why he doesn't want to come out. I also know the buttons I think I can push that would talk him into coming out. Because Bob Woodward's going to tell his story anyway when he's dead. Let's tell it now while he's alive. And sure enough, I went and met Nick's mother, who's a delightful person. And then I met Mark and we, we started off there. And it was a really interesting series of talks I had with him. Yeah, it was. I, I want to okay, go ahead, Weezy. Well, I just thought maybe you could tell us a little bit about how you spoke with him and um, the way that you, you, you turned the conversation from first person to uh, third person to first person. Well, yeah. Uh, Joan introduced me. Uh, then I talked to Mark about all my FBI credentials. Uh, Bill Ruckel's house was my father's partner, was his boss for a while. My dad was an FBI agent. I was friends with Bob Mueller from my U.S. Attorney's Office days. FBI, FBI, FBI. I was a prosecutor. Mark was there nodding his head. This is a good guy. Yes. And then I said, so let me tell you as a young prosecutor why we thought this guy Deep Throat was such a hero. <laughs> And as soon as I said that, Mark's knuckles went white. He grabbed the armchairs, arms to the chair he was sitting in, and they got white. And his, he tightened up. And then I started talking to him about why the young prosecutors thought that this man was a hero, because he made our system of justice uh, clean and made sure we preserved it. And he 
kept it from being politicized. And we were very proud of that. I was a Nixon appointee. And I was very proud of the fact that a bunch of Nixon appointees saw fit to say, yes, you violated the law, Mr. President. I'm sorry, you've got to pay the price. I thought that was the height of American democracy. And when I told him about this, his, it was like I was letting him out of jail. He's got these wonderful blue eyes, and I saw him. They were just like melting, and he was looking at me just in a gaze, and he wasn't disputing anything I said. His arms sort of loosened up. He just looked at me, and then I said, so you, I was always talking about deep throat in the third person, then I went, so you should come out and tell your story, Mark, because you are a hero. You are someone we all need to hear from because you, 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 you. And he sat there like an FBI agent, coolly assessing what I had to say. Meanwhile, on the day bed next to me, Joan, his daughter, and Nick, his grandson, they're just flummoxed. They're almost falling over backwards because this is a guy who angrily denied being deep throat for years. And now it's fairly clear from Mark and my uh, back and forth that this is deep throat. And they were just overwhelmed. Now, Mark didn't admit it, but after I finished talking, he looked at me and he said, in his best FBI voice, (laughs) well, John, I'll consider what you've had to say and I'll give you my decision soon. And of course, (laughs) Joan and Nick, uh, what decision? If you're not deep throat, you're not going to, you don't have a decision to make. And it was clearly he was saying, I'll decide whether to come out. Once again, the deductive reasoning is pretty That's right. <laughs> pretty That's <fair>. right. And, <laughs> and, and Mark and I, actually, we thought very much alike. Uh, he had a, a, a touch of dementia, so he couldn't remember things. But in the moment, he was a very, very sharp guy. He was incredibly astute. He understood what you're asking him. He could parry and thrust with the best of them. And then, of course, he wouldn't remember later on exactly what you said. But what happened was then I'd stirred up such a hornet's nest that he went back to his hard wiring. And when he went out with his caretaker the next day, he was very disturbed. And he said, an, oh, an FBI agent just doesn't act this way. I shouldn't be doing this. An FBI agent just, just doesn't do this. And of course, Adam, his caretaker, Fijian caretaker, he understood the story. He knew I'd been there the day before. And he understood what he was saying, so he would report it back to us. So it would take me and, and Joan to come and bring him back into the fold and remind him that he's a hero. So this went on for a while. And I'll tell you what, what is really kind of fun, but I'll tell you this, is uh, when I wrote the Vanity Fair article, I used the title, I'm the guy they used to call Deep Throat. The reason I did it, was because Mark had hardwired into his psyche, and he's a very clever, very shrewd man, uh, smooth as they come. And he had hardwired into his psyche his defense as to how he could deny he's Deep Throat. Uh, He never answered to the name Deep Throat. In England, you say, he's called John O'Connor. I answer to that call. That's my name because I answer to the call. Well, guess what? Mark never answered to the call of Deep Throat. He was a deep throat as far as he's concerned. So as long as uh, somebody asks him if he's deep throat, uh, then that's, it, it's not a lie if he says no. Mm-hmm. Now, if someone asks him the question, are you the guy that the Washington Post reporters called deep throat? Now he knows the answer to that is yes. Okay. And so uh, uh, I can remember, uh, having these go rounds with Mark in which I I was trying to get a writer. I did not want to write the book. I tried to get an outside writer and I couldn't get a publisher to end up biting uh, because they just didn't know whether to believe me or not. They had to believe me. They not Mark because he had no real memory. So I would bring a writer in and he'd say, well, Mark, now tell me you're deep throat, right? He'd say, Oh no, I'm not deep throat. I'm not deep throat. And I'd have to butt in and I'd say, okay, Mark, you know, tell so-and-so here, you're the guy that used to call Deep Throat, right? He went, oh, yes, of course, of course, that's right. I used, they used to call me Deep Throat. And, and, and pretty soon the writer would get the, the hint. Uh, so he's a very, he was always very shrewd about these things. 
I, I, I about that same point in the movie, I thought one of the most fascinating aspects of the movie with Liam Neeson playing this great poker face was how Mark had to tap dance around the questions when they didn't know it was him. But Mark was involved in the conversation about who could have possibly been the leaker in the FBI. And he had to be completely nonplussed about it and be able to put on this stone face as if he had no idea. And then I, I thought one of the really wonderful moments of drama was when they were all in the bar and it was obvious that his closest companions at the FBI knew it was him. And when Bates turned to him and they had this long pregnant pause and Mark didn't admit he was, but just the eye contact sort of gave the affirmative answer to Bates that yes, he was in fact uh, uh, deep throat. I just thought the psychology of all that was really fascinating. Those guys yeah, really know how to play it close to the best. Well, that's right. And Peter Landisman and I consulted on the movie and we thought that was a very good way to do it because, you know, what happened was the five subordinates around Mark all got shipped out of town, which is the FBI's way of punishing you. Um, uh, they knew there was a leaker. And so five guys shipped out. But Patrick Gray was sure that one guy that wasn't the leaker was Mark Felt. <laughs> yeah. So Charlie Bates, so I'll tell you a personal story. I come to the U.S. Attorney's Office in before I know there's a deep throat incident. This would have been January of 74. The book hasn't come out yet. And on one of my first days, my boss, who was a very high guy in the office, he was kind of the big, big gun. Uh, he says, I want you to meet a really important guy. Uh, he heads up the FBI office and it was Charlie Bates. And Charlie Bates was the guy you're talking about uh, playing in the movie. And he had been shipped to San Francisco. But he'd lived in D.C. his whole life, and he really, at the time, so I met him, and he seemed very, he's a very handsome, uh, just impressive-looking guy, tall, gray hair, uh, Marlboro man. Mm. But he, there was a, 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 a sense of sadness or anger about him, and I said, gee, he's an impressive guy, but what about him? He seemed a little bit forlorn or whatever. And my boss said, well, something happened back in Washington that got him shipped out here. And he's still very, very angry about it. I said, oh, is that right? I wonder what that is. And I never, I didn't put two and two together until later on when I was starting to sleuth about Deep Throat. And I realized why Bates was angry. He was angry because they were suspecting that he was Deep Throat. Of course, Mark didn't. Well, something. how do you feel about the, the Max Holland theory that they had to be in, assisting because Mark felt didn't have time to go and look at Bob Woodward's porch and some of these other, the other aspects of the story that, that don't add up unless he had some assistance or he had like a contingency within the FBI that, that knew he was linking, leaking and were assisting him because they were also outraged that Pat Gray had been appointed in the middle of this crisis. And they, they, they felt for the sake of the Bureau, we need an inside guy at, at the helm. Well, here's what I would say. I, I had a lot of talks with Max Holland, and I love the guy, and I think he's a very bright guy. Uh, he did not consult with me on his theory on this book, and he knew better. Uh, he and I still keep up, and we're very cordial to one another, and Max is a very, very bright guy. However, I would say, uh, you know, other than words like uh and the, I disagree <laughs> with what he's written in his book, and I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. The theory is that Mark somehow was out to get Gray because he resented being passed over. Au contraire, that the reason if you put everything together, he did not want the FBI to in any way get a black mark on. That's why he would never reveal who he was. That's why he wouldn't reveal being in the uh, garage. He And the reason he wanted there not to be any kind of a limitation on the investigation is and he said it and it's even in one of the three uh 302s of the meetings they had it might have been not have been a 302 it might have been just a memo of his first meeting with gray he said we cannot whitewash this investigation because the, he said it, here's the words he said the reputation of the fbi is at stake that's in the june 21 memo right after the first meeting with gray the reputation of the fbi is at stake now, if you hear Gray, then meanwhile, Felt is constantly writing these beautiful memos to the higher ups saying, 
we ought to please ask Earl Silbert if we can just go look at this, at the Donald Segretti uh, dirty tricks. It uh, really would fit in very nicely and would help us prove about the burglary. So my point is, if you're concerned about the FBI's reputation, is the whole idea to go out and make it look like the FBI is leaking like a sieve so that Patrick Gray will get fired and disgraced? It absolutely is 100% antithetical to all Mark Felt's um, uh, motives, reasoning, his intent. It makes absolutely no sense. Now, also, I have in my possession, and Woodward talks about them a little bit in Secret Man, but not quite enough, but Felt wrote these beautiful memos in which he would psychoanalyze a leaked story where Patrick Gray would come in fulminating, oh, has the FBI leaked? Is there a leaker in here? And then, and the Justice Department wanted to know who was leaking and the White House wanted to know who was leaking. And Felt wrote these brilliant memos and which he would say, look at this article here. This person here had statement X and is referring to statement X. The FBI did not have that statement at the time. It couldn't have been anybody from the FBI. And people would read these memos and say, my gosh, Felt's right. He was using counterintelligence types of maneuvers, even though it was, <laughs> he was the leaker, but he would point to some part of the article and say, that couldn't have been me. So everything he did was to try to get the dirt off of the FBI. He, there was some poor guy, one of the prosecutors named Donald Campbell, who was a nice kid and he was the wiretapping expert. They had two senior guys there. And Mark constantly pointed to Donald Campbell as the leaker, <laughs> this poor guy. <laughs> so he was, it, it, he was very, very smooth. Mark was very, very deft at this, but all of this was about the FBI. And uh, so Matt- and one, one point- Opposite. One point that, 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 that sort of enhances what you're talking about, and this was in the movie. I don't know if this was a verbatim quote from Mark, but I thought it resonated in light of our current problems with the Justice Department and wondering how separate they are from the executive branch right now. He has a line in the movie where he said, our job is to keep the FBI a separate independent entity. And I thought, wow, does that resonate right now? Everybody has that same question in America, wondering if they are. Or well, if that's, been that's exactly it. You've got it right there. If you, ha if you were to write the theme of the Watergate story and how it was broken is the FBI demanded to be independent. And remember, so many people didn't like Hoover. Presidents were upset with Hoover, mainly because the, he wouldn't do what they asked him to do when it got political. And so uh, that's what this was about. It was about the FBI's independence. And if you recall in All the President's Men, do you recall the phrase where Woodward said about Deep Throat, he knew too much literature too well? Do you remember that phrase? You may not, but the, you knew too much. And so most people thought, oh, Deep Throat must be some literate Ivy Leaguer who sits around with a pipe and a smoking jacket and, and uh, has read all these books. What did it mean? Well, I knew what it meant. When the FBI was founded uh, after the corrupt Bureau of Investigation was, they, they tried to put an end to that and, and made the FBI. There were these elaborate founding documents passed by Congress about how the FBI was independent. Oh, it's independent, it's so independent, we've got to be non-corrupt. And who, that's the documents under which Hoover, Hoover took over the Bureau. The problem with those documents is it doesn't answer the question of the fact that he must report to the attorney general who must have report to the president. Mm -hmm. So from 1924 on, Hoover made it his mission to make it independent, to, to insist on this rigid ramrod civil service. We're doing our job. Nobody's going to uh, mess with us. So you can make fun of Hoover all you want. He was a bulldog. He was a feisty guy, but his main thing was keeping politics out of it. And that's why Mark felt was such a fan. He's now today, you correctly say, what's going on when the FBI is now a campaign player in the 2016 elections? I don't care whether you're Democrat, Republican, Independent, whatever you are, Green Party, you shouldn't like the FBI coming in and putting their thumb on the scale. It just doesn't look good.
Exactly. Weezy, I know you want to ask questions about Postgate, and I can't wait to get into it. But since we're talking about the independence of the various departments of the government, I just found it fun, uh, Mr. O'Connor, to talk about the parallels between the Trump administration and Watergate. You have special prosecutors that are in top of mind right now. You have questionable activities by attorney generals. You have a base that did this during the Nixon administration that clings to deep state conspiracy about why Nixon's being undermined. And the Trump and the Nixon supporters labeled it a coup when he was being investigated. And I just thought that the, the comparisons are pretty stark right History now. History rhymes. Yeah. Yes, exactly. It doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. And there are a lot of the same themes come up. Uh, the, you know, what I would say about Nixon is, even though from reading Postgate, I would say he did not get a fair trial. The problem is Nixon did a lot of things that were wrong, that were proven criminal. And, and you know, I can think of at least three that I as a prosecutor would say, these are clear acts of obstruction. Uh, two of them proved well, the 18 and a half minute gap, maybe not. But, um, but, but so there are definite parallels. And in the case of Nixon, unfortunately, uh, because of the, he, he let some, he let people run amok. And when Watergate came, he realized that other things would come out. He didn't think he was responsible for Watergate. He couldn't figure it out, the burglary. But he thought that other things would come out, such as, for instance, the burglary of Daniel Ellsberg's psychiatrist, things like that. Which was the done Kissinger, by the same team. By the same team. And then the Kissinger wiretaps, which involved the FBI, but it was Henry Kissinger tapped the New York Times tapped uh, CBS, uh, tapped uh, Joseph Kraft, tapped uh, his national security people. And that's Bill Sullivan, Bill Sullivan, who ultimately hangs Mark Felt, ironically, for something that he hadn't actually leaked. So that's right. It's very, very Shakespearean. Oh, oh, (laughs) let me ask a question about Bill Sullivan, John. Uh, uh, And I don't know anything beyond the movie, but why was he let go from the FBI initially before he returned under L. Patrick Gray? Well, first of all, Hoover promoted Felt mainly to be the anti-Sullivan watchdog because he thought that Sullivan was getting too big for his britches. He was exercising too much power. He was in league with the CIA who wanted to expand under the Houston plan, expand all kinds of mail openings. He was very much an anti-civil libertarian. Hoover could not control Sullivan and brought in Felt to do that. And finally, uh, Sullivan over played his hand. He thought he could get rid of Hoover and was going around him. And when Felt proved that to uh, Hoover, that was the last straw. And so that's how he got rid of him, by convincing Hoover that Sullivan really was. And he was. Sullivan was playing for Hoover's spot uh, and almost did it, almost did it. Uh, But Felt thought that Sullivan was the worst thing for the FBI, because if you look at the bad things the FBI's done, 90 percent of them come from Bill Sullivan. Pro. MLK. The Martin Luther King thing is just terrible. It's stomach. And what when I came to the government, I thought all FBI agents were like that. I thought there were going to be these terrible people, the Bill Sullivan FBI. And that's what bothered Mark so much. And I found out these were the greatest guys in the world. They wouldn't give tricky questions to witnesses, you know, on, on their life. They were straightforward. They let the witnesses know what was going on. If anything, prosecutors got frustrated because they were so straightforward. And I was one of them. I thought they were almost too nice a guys, too honest, too reputable. Uh, and, and of course, I just came to love the guys. Um, well, let's go. The, for, uh, yeah. I yeah. wanted to go chronologically through uh, the publications at after you came to know Mark Felt, the first thing that comes out, and this was just mind blowing to the entire world, was that Vanity Fair article. Yes. So how how did that come to be? Well, for three years, I tried to get Bob Woodward to cooperate with us. I had no intention of writing anything or letting anybody know that I existed. Uh, Bob refused. And as I detail in the book, if anything, led the family to believe that Mark wasn't deep throat. So I had to go out and get a publisher. I finally talked Mark into publishing something without Woodward. And when I went out to try to get a publisher, uh, the first question was, well, what what does Woodward say about this? And I said, well, Woodward uh, denies that it's him. 
Uh, and I had to prove it. Mark couldn't, didn't have a memory. So I had two contracts, one with Time Warner, <laughs> one with a, a Reagan Books, in which I had six months, they had six months due diligence. And in each case, they told me they were writing a check to us and that we're going to do a book and a deal and all this. And I was going to have nothing to do with it. Uh, and in both cases, they backed out at the very last minute from cold feet. So finally, I'd been talking to David Friend at Vanity Fair for years. And finally, I said, David, you got your wish, buddy. We're not going to get a book out of this. We're going to go to your fine magazine. And the family did not want me to go to a tabloid. I told the family I could get you a million bucks at a tabloid. They said, nope, nope, nope. We're going to do this the right way. You go to Vanity Fair. They'll pay us a few bucks for the pictures, but that's about it. They'll pay me a little bit as a writer, the standard writer's fair. So this wasn't about money. It was about getting the story out. But it is funny <laughs> that one year I got a 1099 for a check that one of the publishers had written to me <laughs> and they never sent it. In another case, I actually went up to Time Warner's headquarters to pick up my check. I was going to be in New York for a deposition. I said, well, come over and get my check. They said, great, come on over and get your check. But uh, a few days later, I went up to get my check and they came out and they said, well, We've decided not to do this, John. <laughs> Sorry, here's your, here are your papers back. Wow. It's like the biggest story in the world, but it's so big that people are afraid to run with it in case it's wrong. That's correct. That's exactly what happened. And they, they thought, gee, do we have to trust a lawyer? <laughs> That's really what it was about. So we want to hear about that, that moment. We've all, seen, we've all seen the clip of, uh, of Mark Felt coming to the door and yet everybody was glued to it like, you know, he, does he look happy? Is he okay? Is it, you know, how's he feeling? What, what's going on? And you were there, right? Right. Well, I was in Washington at the time. And interestingly, uh, I, I was trying to keep the press away because they were just trying to literally knock the door down. And, uh, and it really was a very happy day, a happy time because, uh, the security guards had just left that I had hired and, uh, uh, and I think what happened was Nick went out, Nick's girlfriend went outside to film everybody and they were going to film the door. And Mark came to the door and she was going to film it. And when he opened the door, uh, the crowd of media just and the onlookers just erupted and they gave him a cheer. And that was that was a great honor for Mark. And that's what this was about. We talked about it, that the family could enjoy his glory together uh, while he was alive. It was a very, very moving moment. And then you wrote a book with Mark, and that book has had a couple of iterations before and after the film came out, correct? That's correct. Yeah, we did it as G-Man's Life. And then before the film came out, I added maybe 20 more pages, and we called it Mark Felt, the man who brought down the White House. And then recently, as you know, I've come out with Postgate, right. uh, how the Washington face, the Post betrayed Deep Throat, covered up Watergate, began today's partisan advocacy. Journalism. I can't wait to talk about that. I want to ask you one more question about the Deep Throat thing. Maybe because the guy you cast to play L. Patrick Gray in the movie was one of the <laughs> great bad guys of all time. <laughs> Do you think that L. Patrick Gray was put in that position as a way to uh, suppress what Nixon knew about Watergate, it seems like he was in there to scrub Nixon's guilt out of this investigation. Do you think he knew ahead of time that Nixon was culpable in this whole thing? No, he, Pat Gray got appointed, I want to say May, I'm going to guess, Hoover died May 2nd, 1972. Gray was appointed around May 7th, May 9th, 1972, before Watergate. The reason he was appointed was to politicize the Bureau, which is what Mark, Mark feared. And that's why Mark stayed on. Mark wanted to stay on to sort of teach Gray. And Gray was an ex-submarine commander. He thought he was a red, white, and blue guy. But um, what Nixon, the reason he did that was because Felt, who was the logical candidate, would not cave on the deed of beard memo the deed of beard memo was a young reporter, Britt Hume, found a memo of deed of beard outlining in stark terms a bribe to the Republicans by IT and T, ITT, to drop an antitrust suit in exchange for four hundred thousand dollars in cash and four hundred thousand in rooms. 
uh, for the convention, which yeah. in those days was a lot of money. It's like four million today. Yeah. Uh, and and felt refused to go along with the request from John Dean. If you remember, good old John Dean, he refused the request, the demands from John Dean that the FBI declare that memo a forgery. He would and, not they, and they were relentless demands. They had the memo uh, and, and analyzed by their own hired hired experts. It just went on and on. It it it, it didn't let up. And 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 Mark felt held firm. And at the beginning of that, when L. Patrick Gray was first appointed to that job, Dean had sent over the request, what happened to all the files that Hoover had after Hoover died? And Mark Felt refused to turn them over. And that seems where it went south with the White House and Mark Felt at that point, because he wouldn't well, hand over the records. Well, Mark was already pushed aside at that point. Patrick Gray had already been appointed when when this was going on, I know Patrick Gray originally first came over and asked for the files and then later on was appointed just a few days later, but felt was not in the picture uh, as an appointee. Mm -hmm. uh, Gray always was. Uh, and uh, exactly, uh, there were a bunch of files shipped off to Hoover's house. And that's the real mystery as to what was in those files. Um, I suspect, remember people think that Hoover was a big extortion artist uh, he certainly enjoyed the fact that uh, people were afraid of him and, and thus did not try to tread on his turf. But he really never tried to actively extort anything from anybody based on files. And I think he was legitimately afraid and felt was legitimately afraid of letting all this stuff out into the hands of Nixon because it's confidential stuff. Today, everything leaks like a sieve. Mm -hmm. The FBI was not leaking. <laughs> you you yeah, have. Hoover, no. But do you think that in, in the film and in Woodward's book, the, it's depicted that the files are just destroyed upon news of Hoover's death? Do you think that they that, that that's what happened? No, I do not. Uh, that was a little bit of poetic license. Uh, Peter loved it, uh, the fact that, and I think what had happened was, originally somebody came over and said, it might have been Grace, said, we want your secret files. And this is one thing Peter didn't do the way I wanted him to do it in real life. They came over and said, we want your secret files. And this guy named John Moore, the head FBI guy, said, we don't have secret files. They said, no, we want secret files. Said, we don't have secret files. They didn't use the right words. They were confidential files. They were not <laughs> secret. You know? So that's the FBI. You better use the right words. So meanwhile, in the days after that, that Gray went stalking away, they did box up maybe, I don't know how many boxes, 10 boxes, 12 boxes that went to Hoover's house. Uh, that were his personal and confidential as opposed to official and confidential. Everything that was official and confidential supposedly stayed there. Everything that was personal and confidential went to Hoover's house. And according to Felt, never the twain shall meet, but we do not know that. And so personal and confidential, there may have been a lot of senators and their mistresses in those files. Let me put it that way, because they had all that stuff. And that's what I think Felt was afraid of going out to the public because there was some real, you know, some bad personal stuff that wasn't really anything anybody should know about. Mm -hmm. um, when you catch uh, a senator at, at, with his girlfriend at a hotel and you write, tell the FBI, well, that's not a federal crime, but the FBI can't destroy that information. It has mm -hmm. to keep it. Uh, and, and, and they did a good job of not leaking it. And so I think Felt was preserving the institution of the FBI. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about your great, uh, most recent book, Postgate, which is a fascinating theory, John. Tell us in general the theory that you posit. Well, of course, I would love to say that it's conclusively proven fact uh, in cement and uh, for all eternity will be proven, but you're correct, it is a theory. And what I, uh, what I do is half of the book is about my interactions with Mark, with Deep Throat, then with Woodward, in which these strange interactions start occurring once I start talking to Woodward. So my nose keeps, keeps getting put in the dumpster and I can't understand what it is. And I write it like a thriller. And then finally I said, you know something, something's wrong here. I've got to, uh, after a particular stomach turning incident, uh, I began researching and then I had my I had my interns, I had my clerks 
copying for years. I think it took them years to copy 3,000 Washington Post uh, articles. They're very hard to get off the uh, off the fi uh, digital files. But I went through and went through, read everything I could. And my theory was that I think the Post had suppressed the truth in Watergate because every time I wanted to write in my book about something that did not quite jibe with the regular conventional narrative, the Post and the Post acolytes went nuts. And I thought, this is, a, this is an odd reaction for someone who's telling the truth. People so the Post was keeping, truth. just to clarify, the, the Post was keeping very close tabs on the book that you were writing with Mr. Felt. Right. And unbeknownst to me, the Post, I will use the word defrauded, the post, the pub, my pu publisher defrauded me by concealing from me the fact that even though they were quote privately owned, the private owners of the of the publisher were somehow affiliated with the post. I've never figured out who it was, why, uh, you know. But 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 they were post controlled. It was a post controlled book, and I did not know it, or I would not have selected them. And your That's feeling is they sabotaged the sale of your book by writing bad reviews about it, and they suppressed the sale of your book because they didn't want your theory to get out there and muddy up the waters for the theory that they had forwarded since the beginning of the investigation. Right. The first time I spoke ill of Woodward, the publisher actually started yelling at me and said, the book's not about Woodward. And I joked. And I said, well, you know, if you're going to write about Abbott, don't you have to write about Costello or Stanley? You got to write about Livingston. And nobody laughed. None of the editors laughed. I guess so. Was a, but yes. And uh, they did not like it when I started talking about facts other than uh, the ones that they wanted me to talk about. Yeah. They got and your upset. feeling is that um, the reason why they suppressed it was they had this very clear narrative with the Woodstein uh, investigation and didn't want to go broader because you felt like they, as many of the mainstream media had, had a liberal bent, a liberal agenda, and their uh, their desire was to get Nixon out of office, ultimately. Well, yes, uh, uh, th that's true. Um, here's what happened. I think the Post was a good paper and had good standards, had good editors. But then what happened is if you were going to tell the truth in Watergate, who were you going to nail? One of the parties you were going to nail, if you nailed the CIA, who was really very uh, central to this whole thing, if you're going to nail the CIA, then you're going to say, why was the CIA involved in this? And if you do that, you're going to have to then reveal what the DNC was up to, which they had a, a referral system when you're out of town, a Democrat coming in from Montana. They're going to fix you up with one of the girls down the street and you got to negotiate your price and so forth. That's who the CIA wanted to listen to. And that's who they were listening to in Watergate. Now, if that were revealed, if that was reported, then you would not be only hurting the CIA. You would be hurting the DNC. And the Washington Post was uh, uh, joined at the hip with the DNC. They even shared the same general counsel, Joseph Califano. So it's almost like they didn't start out saying, we're going to defraud somebody. They just stayed away from it. Like you said, they, they just didn't talk about an item. And then as more and more evidence accumulated, <laughs> they had to do more and more uh, deceit. And so that's really the terrible thing about this reporting, because some of it was so good. I'm not going to say it wasn't really good and energetic and somebody was paying attention and somebody was looking at the White House. Those are good things. But you also have a CIA that's being abusive. Mm -hmm. So I know you want to implicate the CIA in your theory, but isn't isn't it possible that Segretti and the Dirty Tricks team were looking for scandal on Democrats, and maybe prostitution hookups were being arranged through the through the DNC office? But it was 1972, and there was still a man's code between reporters and politicians, and the press was still covering up sex, and they would continue to do so until the Gary Hart incident. So isn't it isn't it possible? that it was just part of the bag of dirty tricks. Well, I would agree with you that there was still probably this male code about not talking about prostitution. I agree with that. However, uh, the CIA was the more robust figure here. And there should have been no reason, especially when the, when the 
Nixon administration started saying, hey, there's a lot of evidence of the CIA here. And then the Post actually affirmatively, and I don't go into this part of the book, but they affirmatively wrote an awful lot of op-eds about how nonsense it was that uh, the Nixon administration was suggesting the CIA was involved. So it was more than simply the man's code. I mean, if, if I were doing it, I would lay off uh, as much as I could the sort of the seamier side of this, but I would definitely get into, because I, I, it, it didn't bother me that much that somebody was doing that from the DNC, very frankly. I'm, okay, somebody didn't come in from out of town, so what? But uh, the, the, the CIA and what they were doing was deeply disturbing, and it really is a foreshadowing of other abuses that they continued to engage in over the years, and they've never been called to account for it. And so what we get is we really have an out-of-control CIA. And do you uh, think that they were hoping to accomplish? Well, the CIA? Yeah. Oh, the CIA, if you read the story of the uh, – Office of Security, or OS, it is the most highly secretive part of the CIA. And within the OS, there was something called the Security Research Staff, which was even more secretive. And they had done some terrible things over the years, Operation Bluebird, Operation Artichoke, Art, uh, MK Ultra. I had a case in the U.S. Attorney's Office where the CIA put so much an unsuspecting gentleman, a tennis pro who had went to a VA hospital, was given massive doses of LSD on the orders of the CIA, and then the nurses took down in copious detail the way he reacted. Now, of course, the poor fellow died after two or three days, but I read those notes, and they said things like, my head is exploding, I'm in so much pain, I can't take it. And, and so for two or three days of agony, these things are recorded. Then Eisenhower's, and I had the letters. I've seen the letters. Herbert Brownell, the AG, Jacob Javits, if you remember him, Senator from New York, was the New York AG and the head of VA, all wrote congratulatory letters to each other about how uh, to hush this up and how great it was that we hushed this up and kept it from the widow. So the widow didn't find out until 1977 or six with the church hearings. So this is the kind of stuff these guys were doing. It is not just just nicey nice stuff. Doing. They were doing terrible things. Many involved prostitutions, males and prostitutions, often drugging the John. There was a, a place set up in in San Francisco that's acknowledged with this Colonel Harry White, where they were drugging uh, unsuspecting males, watching them through two way mirrors, recording everything with the prostitutes. This is part and parcel of that that had been going on for years. So it wasn't innocent stuff. And not only that, everything the CIA did in the United States was illegal. They did not have in their charter the ability to do these operations. So it's a whole seamy side of the CIA. When Richard Helms left office, he destroyed mountains of information, mountains, and uh, just sort of smirked about it. Uh, but it was really a bad deal. And these guys were bad actors. And um, your and feeling I, is yeah. that uh, Nixon was as much a victim as he was uh, of being culpable in the water. He was guilty, but not as guilty as the CIA was. Yeah, Nixon would have trouble being honest about anything. That's just his nature. He's right. kind of a tricky, skulky, uh, weird guy and was always paranoid about the press. But sometimes paranoids really do have enemies. Uh, and um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. He was he was a victim and a victimizer. He was both. And because of the way the Washington Post withheld information, and Woodstein cherry picked, and how that played out over history, you can make a really interesting connection just to draw it back to the present. That uh, today's deep uh, uh, mistrust of the mainstream media, the the partisan journalism the fake news that goes on now can all really, and it's going to be traced back to that type of reporting that was developed during Watergate. And also a, a, a very enlightening theory you have about why they uh, were so intent on uh, cultivating this 
um, investigative journalism, and that was it put the Washington Post on the map. Until that story came out, they, were, they weren't even a player. That's right. What Watergate did is it made, quote, investigative reporting a big deal. Well, what's investigative reporting? Aren't reporters supposed to investigate even before 1972? The answer is yes. But you're supposed to be investigating who, why, who what, uh, why, and so forth. What this did was it was almost like uh, political power politics. It ennobled and enshrined the idea that you could assassinate a political leader, in essence, through your reporting. Why is it that most young journalists went to journalism school after Woodward and Bernstein? It was quote, to change the world. Well, how are you going to change the world? You're going to change the world by getting your targets and hitting them. And that's what we, and, and if you're going to be a political power, you've got to choose your team. I don't say here that there's something that's inherently left about the state of the media. It's not. It's just, I think you have more people in the press that happen to be on the left side of the spectrum than on the right side. But I think, <laughs> I think standards have gone out the window and people are really writing more for political effect so that, look, look at me, I'm a power. Look what I've done. Look what I've done for my cause. I've caused five percentage points for the Democrats in this. I've caused uh, uh, Trump to look good in this state. So all of this is not what a, a member of the media should be. The media has jumped the shark, to use a phrase. Well, I got to tell you, this is a really, really interesting book. And there's nobody closer to that whole huge piece of American history than you. It's been an honor to talk to you. His book is Postgate, and it's, uh, it, it is a wonderful read. It's really well written. You spin a good yarn, and it's by Post Hill Press, and it's available on Amazon.com because that's where I got it. We appreciate your time so much, Mr. O'Connor. It was uh, fascinating. Let me say this, and I, I'm not saying this just to say it. Uh, anybody who knows me knows this. You have asked the best questions I've been asked in the last 15 years. So thank you for actually knowing what you're talking about. Well, I'll tell you, okay. my, my co-host here is obsessed with this topic, and since it occurred, has made herself a student of the Watergate era, so she has been beside herself with excitement with a chance to talk to you about this. Yeah, some of the things you all know are not known by other people, and I really appreciate the intelligence with which we've had this discussion, because I, that's my problem. We're not having intelligent discussions in the, the public sphere today. Thank you so much for being with us, Mr. O'Connor. Thank Continue. you. It's been a pleasure. Absolutely. Thank you so much, John O'Connor, for joining us for this conversation. It was really, really fascinating. I'm Louise Palanker here with Fritz Coleman. You take care of yourself. This is Media Path, and we will see you next week. 